Thank you for leading us, Professor Evans. Let's turn in our New Testaments to the book of James. James chapter 4. And we'll be focusing this morning on the first 10 verses of James' fourth chapter. As Pastor York led us in our first chapel yesterday and reminded us of the importance of prayer, so James has much to say to us about our Christian walk. Hear God's holy word. James chapter 4, beginning at verse 1 through verse 10. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, as has already been prayed, we ask that you would attend the opening of your word by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would speak to hearts and minds. Lord, change us and conform us to your word. We ask in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You've read James 4, perhaps not just once or twice, perhaps a number of times. And if you're like me, the more you read it, sometimes it seems the less I understand it. It's a difficult passage. And how can we as seminarians understand this passage and how can it be applied to our lives? Well, one of the ways that we can do that is to examine figures from the Old Testament and see parallels in their lives that fit right into James chapter 4. And of course, we can see in the life of Jesus Christ how his life fits beautifully into James 4. Well, since I have 20 minutes instead of full time for a sermon, we're just going to take a snippet of the life of the patriarch Joseph and see how his life reflects in James chapter 4 and hopefully draw it together for us as seminarians. So James begins by talking about the world. Look at verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Well, for us as seminarians, we're not so much in the world. Most of us are here. We spend most of our time with seminarians and studying God's word. So how does the world apply to us? And I would suggest that the world applies to us in a number of ways. As a matter of fact, being in seminary doesn't mean that we are outside of the world. The world has temptations for us just as much here as it does when we were, say, working before we were in seminary. So how do we identify the world? It doesn't have to be a strip club or down at the casinos. The world is around us. We can find the world at home within our families. We can find it at the workplace. And we can find the world in the deepest recesses of our own hearts. 
So as we reflect upon our lives as seminarians, I think the key to understanding James 4 and the world is to realize that there is no place that is neutral. That is, every circumstance, every classroom, every interaction at home has the potential of being worldly in terms of its temptations. Let me explain. Let's think about the world and the family. First of all, let's think about the world and the family. And all of us are believers, I trust. All of us are raising our families in a Christian fashion. So how can the world impede in our family life? Well, this is where Joseph comes in. Joseph is the great-grandson of patriarch Abraham. It's in Joseph's line that salvation will be extended. And were there any problems in his family life? His family was the most dysfunctional family. I mean, uh, even Dr. Scipione would find challenges with Joseph's family. They were, they were so dysfunctional that they wanted to kill their brother. Now, we all have family strife, but the extent of their hatred toward patriarch Joseph is unparalleled. So a dysfunctional life, a dysfunctional family life, is not just out in the world. We face family problems ourselves. We face trials and temptations within the most sacred space of our own homes. We as fathers and mothers need to stand as great examples in the, the sacred circle of the family. And Joseph's problem within the home was directly related, you ready, to his piety. The Holy Spirit was working mightily in his life, giving him dreams, prophetic dreams, and perhaps rather foolishly, he almost boasts about it to his father and to his brother, so he doesn't handle it well. My question to us as seminarians is how are we handling the opportunity that we have to learn and to serve here in the seminary? Are we maintaining a pious face when we're within this building. And then we go home and we let, it, we let our guard down. Brothers and sisters, we've got to realize that the discipleship that is beginning here in this second chapel and the second day of school needs to be taken across the street to our apartments or wherever it is that we live. The world can very much be in the family. But the world can also be in our workplace. Many of us work outside of the seminary. And many of us go to work every day as if it were some kind of a neutral place. That is, well, it's neither a place of temptation nor is it a place of great challenge. It's just where I work. And as we think about Joseph, we have a beautiful example of the world being in the workplace. The workplace for Joseph was the household of Potiphar. And in that workplace was a woman named Mrs. Potiphar. And you know Mrs. Potiphar's story. She was a sexual temptress. But Mrs. Potiphar can represent a host of temptations. It's not just sexual. She despised her husband and she hated Joseph too. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Potiphar thirsted and lusted for authority and power, not so much sexual satisfaction. In this situation, God opposed Mrs. Potiphar. And how does that relate to our passage? Look with me at verse 6. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God gave Joseph the power, almost literally, to flee from the devil herself. 
And in verse 4, James tells us that friendship with the world is simply unwise. Imagine Joseph trying to be friends with Mrs. Potiphar. If he would have tried to be her friend, he would have become God's enemy. Imagine a foolish conversation. Well, I know we can't be lovers, Mrs. Potiphar, but can we be good friends? No. No, Joseph can't be friends with her. And it's the same situation for us outside of the seminary in the workplace. You know your situation. You can't be friends with the temptations of the workplace. You have to have the courage to say no. You can't be friends with Mrs. Potiphar. The third place of the, wor of the world, the third place where we find the world, is within the self. The third place is within the self. And notice the psychology of the first verses. James asks questions concerning the cause of quarrels and fights. And we have to face the fact that there are quarrels and fights within all of our families, and by extension, within our churches as well. And the answers that James finds to the reason for these quarrels and fighting is all internal. It's not because there's insufficient funds in the checkbook or the kids are behaving badly. The cause is between the years. The cause is within ourselves. Why? James says, well, you have passions that are at war within you. You desire something and you don't have it. So what do you do? You murder. Now, I trust that none of us have been convicted of murder. So how can James be writing to a congregation? How can he be writing to us? I mean, it seems like he's describing some kind of pagan community. But it's not a pagan community. It's a church. He's not speaking to somebody else outside. He's speaking to us in the chapel. We yearn for things that we can't have, and we murder with our lips. Jesus, of course, tells us that we're guilty of murder when we speak evilly of a brother or a sister. So you covet something and you cannot obtain. You fight and you quarrel. Brothers and sisters, we find the world and the world's temptations wherever we are. So how can we put this together? How can we draw the lessons of James 4, 1 through 10, and apply it to us in our situation here in the seminary? James has some positive application. Look with me at verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. As we think about the life of Joseph, while we don't have as much detail as most of us would like, clearly Joseph drew near to God often, frequently during his struggles. He's accused of rape. He's thrown into jail, and yet he's righteous. Where else can he go except the throne of God? He's lifted up high in Pharaoh's household, and for seven years he's telling the Egyptians, do not eat the extra grain. Do not eat, put it in the bank. Don't you know that there's going to be seven years of starvation? And, and the Egyptians all said, oh, oh, of course. We don't want to overeat during the time of plenty. Oh, of course, we're glad to come under your yoke for seven years because of some famine that we may never see. No, in his exaltation, Joseph clearly had to draw near to God. And none of us are as prominent as Joseph. Well, Dr. York might be soon. <laughs> none of us face the temptations and the trials that Joseph faced day in and day out. But all of us need to take James' command to heart. Brothers and sisters, how do we as seminarians draw near to God? And the answer is easy. We're doing it right now. 
We draw near to God as we come together in this time of social worship. We call upon the name of the Lord. We sing praises to Him. We pray to Him. So, uh, you, by the way, you signed a contract. You have to come to chapel. But it's really good that you come here. And as uh, the advertisement was made yesterday, it's also good at 1 o'clock on Tuesdays to draw near in time of prayer. But as I want to apply it to us as seminarians, let me ask you who are single, are you engaging in private prayer and individual worship on a regular, dare I say, daily fashion? Or are you saying, well, you know, I have to do exegesis for Dr. Kinnear. That's good enough. Are you leading your families in times of prayer? Are you helping your spouse as a spiritual guide? But there's something else, one that's particularly difficult for me, and this is why I wanted, one of the reasons why I wanted to share it. Look with me at verse 9. We draw near, first of all, but secondly, James tells us to weep. Be wretched and mourn and weep. I'm an American man. We don't weep. When your mother dies, you can weep. If a child dies, you can weep. But we've been trained that that's, well, that's just not manly. But Joseph, who was truly a man's man, was able to weep. And I want to ask us, when did we weep last? Why don't we weep? By the way, American culture is wrong. Weeping isn't something that's an option. We are commanded here to weep. And why don't we weep? It's because we take our sins too lightly. Our sins don't stain as deeply in our minds as they do in reality. We, re we don't realize how easy it is for every one of us in this room to become a friend of the world. We want that friendship. We follow our inner lusts. And we don't weep. Brothers and sisters, when we see the hideousness of sin and the grandeur of God's glory, how can we not weep? In response to our failures, why don't we shed tears? And the answer is, oh, we will. So I need to ask every one of us, and now I want to focus on the men. Men, when did you weep last? And thirdly and finally, in terms of applying this text, verse 10 tells us to be humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. Now God directly humbled Joseph. He brings him down into the dungeon. He lifts him up to Potiphar's house. He brings him down into the dungeon. He lifts him up to be second only to Pharaoh. God had His finger on Joseph's life. What about our lives? In Joseph's life, we see God directly humbling him. But in the life uh, in our lives, we don't have those, uh, those same kind of direct humblings. So how can we humble ourselves, which once again is not a pious suggestion. It's a divine command. We humble ourselves with a two-fold effort. We humble ourselves with a two-fold effort. That is self-giving and self-denying. Self-giving and self-denying. It's a denial of ourselves to go and do evangelism. It's a denial of ourselves to give that counsel that takes two or three hours. It's a denial of ourselves to volunteer for VBS, a thankless task. It's a denial of ourselves to go pick up bread for the community. These thankless tasks are the beginnings of work in the church. Brothers and sisters, if you feel called to the life of ministry, 
begin the thankless task now because I can only promise you more thankless tasks. Another way that we humble ourselves is by giving up the pleasure and the nourishment of a meal and replace that time of rest and refresh refreshment with drawing near to God in prayer. And finally, as we think about denying ourselves, we think about our emotional life. Many of you have little children and little children are defined by being unable to control their emotions. We need to spend time thinking about our lusts and our desires and crying out to the king of the universe for his help as we face the inner turmoil that afflicts each one of us. Thanks be to God that he gives us a pathway to walk and the power of the Holy Spirit to walk like a Joseph in uprightness. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the challenge of this text. And all of us in this room need to be challenged. And as, as we measure our lives, we fall short and we cry out for mercy. Lord, help us to learn to cry again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.